here this afternoon and it might be useful if I just introduce who is here and what is here. Um, working around the room, the work on in this apps here is by Mark Fisher who is with us for the next 22 minutes after which he has to take a plane to New York. He's the gentleman in the fair isle sweater and the clear glasses. Um, then we have the work. Uh, Mark, incidentally, was a student at the AA uh, up to about three years ago, and now is running one of the first year units at the AA. And his uh, description of his work is in Artnet 2 on the brown pages. Mark Premack is still a student, just coming into fifth year. Originally a Rhode Island School of Design and in fact comes from Providence. And he also is here this afternoon. At the end is the work of a student at the A who finished at the end of this summer, Austrian, Cyrillian guy, who is at, current, at the moment working in Paris on the Plateau Bobo scheme with Piano and Rogers. And so he can't be with us this afternoon. 
And then moving round behind a, a row of heads here is the work of Paul Shepherd, who finished at the A two years ago, and I think is already back again teaching um, in one of the, the summer school units. I don't think he's going to come this afternoon. Rumor has it that he may not actually come. Um, and finally, Will Olsa, uh, another, I suppose, product of the AA, who also, interestingly, uh, studied at art college before he ever decided to do architecture, and is also back again, amongst other things, teaching at St. Martin's. And I think this uh, sort of art architecture connotation may be something that we pick up later in the afternoon. Having said that, I'd like to introduce the panel of worthies Amongst here <laughs> this afternoon. Uh, Alvin Boyarski, Director General of the Architectural Association, <laughs> Canadian, <laughs> sometime raconteur of wit, uh, has uh, taught at other places actually before. I mean, there was a life before he ever came to the A, which included Oregon and Cornell and. Uh, Montreal and other things. Then, on my right, immediately, Dr. Delabor Vasily, who interestingly was trained as an engineer and an architect before doing his doctorate in art history. And he comes from Prague and was a member of the group called the Continualists, which still continues, uh, <laughs> fortunately, based on Paris. Uh, my name is Peter Cook, I'm incognito this afternoon. And then I moved quickly on to James Gowan, who I'm sure you all know was one of the authors of the engineering building at Leicester, a very strange house for Mr. Schreiber in Hampstead and various other uh, housing works. What I think is interesting about James Gowan is that he's one of the sort of hidden gurus of the present um, situation at the A, even though he's not actually on the payroll this year. He's still one of the people that, that has influenced a lot of people who are, which I think is worth saying. Uh, even though if you look in the current issue of, or the current book called Radical Architecture, you'll see that he's recently designed a giraffe, um, which I'm sure he'll be able to explain at some other occasion. We then, moving leftwards, uh, have Cedric Price, um, recently, <laughs> frequently featured in the, in the supplement, Cedric Price supplement, raconteur, bon viveur, wit, uh, hoping to leave this terrible room in the next half hour if I go on like that. And uh, the, the rest of our particular bit of the faculty, as they say, Ingrid Morris, who had a, an extensive introduction yesterday, I think, <laughs> and Ron Heron, Wonderful relation. mate, partner, <laughs> Arpigram, all of that. that. That's the panel, but I assume that people will, will blow in and blow out as they feel the need. Um, I wonder, Mark, since mm. you have to catch a TWA no, <laughs> 403, would right. you like to say this? Right. Um, well, obviously, none of you can say very much until I tell you what it's all about. And uh, the drawings are so small that, really, for any of you more than about three feet away, they won't be even visible as drawings. But to start at the beginning, the, the whole of this series of drawings is a cartoon about a man in his early 30s who's bald and looks remarkably like myself, who goes to a place in the North Pacific where the... Colombian government have been busy for a number of years mutating seaweed into a number of interesting forms. Now, I chose the Pacific because already in the Pacific there are a number of interesting seaweeds which grow there naturally. They're seaweeds which are in fact the largest plants to grow on the surface of the earth. They grow approximately 400 feet in the course of a year. And uh, Although they don't have the same bulk of the Canadian redwoods, the maximum length which they attain is generally in the order of 600 feet. They grow from the ground surface about 100 feet below the seabed, and they grow essentially up from the seabed to the sea surface and then trail along the surface of the sea down current 
generally speaking, for obvious reasons, and they're supported there by air bladders. The interesting thing being that these air bladders contain a remarkable quantity of oxygen amongst other gases. And likewise, the, the various chemicals which are found inside the seaweeds are extremely unusual in natural plants. They contain a number of things like alginic acid, which have very heavy molecular weights. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But the, the main thing being that I was looking at these seaweeds because I'd been interested for a number of years in the fact that a lot of people like Ratten Ray Taylor um, and Alvin Toffler had been speculating on what a dreadful thing it was going to be when the biologists finally twigged on how the, they could mutate the genetic structure of natural reproducible organisms so that we could begin to produce what we wanted. Um, it seemed to me that basically it was unlikely that anyone would cotton on to doing this to higher forms of life like animals and people for quite a long time, um, simply because the amount of information involved is ridiculously large. The information which is used to transmit genetic structures from one generation to the next is contained in the cell in structures known as chromosomes, which are essentially very long high polymers, uh, very large protein molecules, and inside a typical bacteria, these m molecules might attain a total length of something close on a millimeter. Now, if you bear in mind the size of a bacterial cell, which might only be three or four angstroms wide, you realize that to coil that millimeter up, you're doing pretty well. But by the time you come up to higher forms of life, such as ourselves, we find that the chromosome chains inside the cell structure are in fact attaining lengths much closer to five or six millimeters, even longer. In, in human beings, the theoretical calculation indicates that it should be something in the region of about half a centimeter, which is pretty damn long to coil up inside something that's only, in a human being, about 10 angstroms across. Now, the point is that each one of the atoms comprising that molecular chain is a carrier of information in very much the same way as the dots and dashes in a Morse code. Consequently, to break the code at a very crude level, one anticipates that it's simply a matter of being able to handle a large amount of information and speculate on what varying particular elements of the information will do to the finished product. And that is what part of this is about, a mechanism whereby this might be done. Now, what I proposed was that by taking a very low form of life and essentially algae, of which seaweed are one particular class, are very low. They come immediately after the bacteria in the sequence of plant hierarchies. Um, algae stopped evolving, essentially, many millions of years ago, because all the, pl the forms of the algae plants that we find today, we can find very close um, evidence of their having existed in very early geological times as far as relates to life existing at all. And so what I proposed was that a research program had been set up by the Colombian government, because they have all these plants on their Pacific doorstep, to start the evolutionary sequence again by simply undertaking a massive program of mutation and manipulation of the genetic structure of these plants with particular goals in mind. Now, one of the goals was to increase the size of the air bladders so that they were large enough for people to get into. And on this sheet here, we find a sequence in which they concern themselves with trapping the spores which come off the plants when they are about to reproduce. Then they cart them away, mutate them, sprout them, and bring them back. And over a period of about 10 years, they finally hit it off and got bigger and bigger bladders until they were big enough to get into and then they concentrated on developing the bladders further until they were actually capable of making them translucent and finally transparent, so that they became fairly useful objects for people to live inside while working on undersea research programs, because from the, so the photosynthetic processes which go on in the plant in order to generate its own cellulose structure, 
there's lots of free oxygen liberated which the people living inside the plants were able to breathe. Now, that covers virtually all of the thing up for the first four. The secondary hypothesis which I pick up on in it concerns a Frenchman who's the professor of hygiene in Paris called Curbrand, who devoted some of his life for the last 12 years to considering a lot of anomalies in natural processes which tend to get overlooked by ordinary biologists and botanists concerning the action of plant and animal enzymes during the development of uh, plant and animal structures. Now, what, to take just one example, what he was observing was that if you take two fertilized hen's eggs which have just been laid and you take one of the eggs and you incinerate it and analyze the ash, you will find that it contains, <coughs> excluding the calcium in the, in the shell, quite a large amount of potassium, but virtually no calcium at all in the yolk or albumin of the egg. If you allow the other egg to hatch, you will find that the chick that comes out of it has bones in it. And needless to say, the bones are very largely made up of calcium, which is obviously ridiculous because you knew from your previous assay of the first egg that there was no calcium present in either the yolk or albumin. Consequently, it must have come from somewhere. It hasn't come from the shell because we know that the chick had to crack its way out of the shell. And so one might presume either that your experiments were yielding totally the wrong answers or that in some way the processes which went on in that fertilized and developing egg led to the transmutation of the potassium into the calcium which made up the bones of the hen's egg. Now enough of that as an example because there are many comparable examples of these anomalies which have been observed with lobsters synthesizing copper, with bacteria synthesizing or apparent, one has to say apparently because the, there is a lot of evidence, experimental evidence of isolated inexplicable cycles um, but there is no demonstration of how the thing operates at all. Um, but one which is very close to home with macrobioticists who insist on eating sprouted beans and feeling that for some reason they must be better than the original beans apart from the fact that they don't make you fart quite so much um, is that in the sprouted bean there is generally a much higher quantity of iron present than there was in the original bean uh, before it was allowed to come into contact with the water and that iron apparently comes from various other trace elements which are transmuted and these particular trace elements are very close in molecular weight and composition to the alginic acid which is present in the seaweed. So ran my tenuous argument that it was reasonable to suppose that in their evolutionary program they would also attend to the possibility of harvesting iron from the sea by photosynthesis and the appropriately mutated seaweeds. So <coughs> that begins to concern the last two sheets which also... <laughs> Uh, must hurry up. I mean, must have some reaction to all this. Uh, but, um, of course, you can't drive a submarine around in seaweed because the propeller gets fankled up. Um, and so I just took the opportunity to put in a few other dreams um, which occur originally in Amish Amari over there who turned his historic automat into a fish boat in order to cross the channel and cli climb up the the White Cliffs of Calais, uh, which I discovered later didn't exist, um, when he found that the British uh, Sea Link travel service was on strike. Um, the thing about fish boats is that they would potentially provide a remarkably efficient means of transport. Um, that's been written about elsewhere by myself and others. And they use it as a means of transport to get around. And there's a lovely thing at the end, which is the manta ray which Cedric is reputed to think quite nice. All right. Uh, that's not bad. You've got five minutes now. So I, I, I really hate to think what anybody can say because it's... Um, it, well, it feels to me that it's not... Um, it, it's not proposed as, a, as anything that can be argued about. It, you can argue, well, you can argue about it at a, 
at a cultural level as to whether, given that level of biological manipulation as a potential, you would find it desirable to interfere with nature to this rather gross extent. I think that becomes one of the central aspects because, to me, the kind of the engineering logic behind it is is fairly coherent and. Um, in a way, this is just one of many possible ways in which the proposal could have been handled in a plant engineering context. The, the part of the reason for looking at the thing under the sea was that one of the great difficulties with structures above ground is that you have gravity to contend with in order to make the thing stand up, whereas if you operate beneath the sea, assuming that the human beings inside it are going to need to operate in something fairly close to an atmospheric condition, you can use the gas to develop a, new, a pneumatic structure capable of tensioning the membrane. Um, that's really the only part of it which has any bearing on the, the forms that are proposed. Aren't you really saying that we are the wrong public? No, I don't think so. On the other hand, we might think that the double place. I don't think so. Place has a so little time there. I question your first. Um, <laughs> I question your first sentence. You said none of you can say anything until I've told you what it's all about. Um, I no, that that Cedric was addressed to those who haven't looked at it. <laughs> I think the only thing that you could have done actually was the was put up a sign, which was your last sentence, to remind us all on the on the gravity factor. Just that was the only thing, or it could have come in there. What I think is long before you get onto the level of, of the usefulness of, of, uh, of uh, distortion in relation to plant form, is that, that there's, uh, in, in this, there is um, a very clear indication of how, in fact, you can extend ideas um, and, and productive ideas that do cause distortion, which I'm told is what architecture is about as well, you know, an unnatural operation of distortion, um, that actually can, one can take content from that you, in fact, don't have to backpedal, as so many people do, in saying, well, really, what caused me to do that was that I thought about this first and then did that. And I, I find it a very ex expanding um, a lot of ideas, which I think, um, I mean, it's, it is, it's, it's a crit, say, isn't it? Did you say expanding? Expanding, yes. I, I find that some ideas, one just nods at the end of them and thinks, ah, glad I know it now. <laughs> expanding ideas, the more useful ones, mm -hmm. that you finish up thinking, wow, I can, I can think a bit more now. That's the value. Um, I mean, if we, I don't know if one wants to talk about drawings or things. I talk about jokey things, for instance, that your forms in relation to gravity are quite right. The man who looks remarkably like you, and I'm sorry he's not sitting on that deck chair, um, talks about a WC, and, and we're still using, um, you know, wire-reinforced flexible piping for evacuation or supply. All of those I find a little uh, mid-20th century. Um, <laughs> I, well, God, we've only got a few minutes. He's off in a minute. Oh, the only thing is, the other thing that the you know the business of the your ex, the chromos, chromos, chromosonic information transmission system, um, I think could have been actually in that, mm -hmm. in those things on the wall a bit more because that's key to it. Yeah. Uh, right. Oh, the, no, last thing, last thing, maybe because of the, the sort of climate of, of the so-called depressed Western world at the moment, there's a very interesting, uh, it isn't underlying, but it occurs occasionally, attitude about borrowing of, you know, borrowing off nature, you know, they're making the oxygen, perhaps you can use it as well. I don't say it's good or bad, it's interesting because it's, it's, a, it's a borrower rather than a a reaper. Mm. Could I comment on the drawings, which I, 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 I find, um, and my comment I think applies to all of them, I find them bewildering. 
but I don't mind that, and, and I, I don't really mind being amazed and stunned. And, but there seems to be a curious paradox about your drawings, as far as I'm concerned, and that is that that you appear to be promoting a real manageable idea, and you, you use a graphic form that, that, that one associates with make-believe, and therefore I wonder if you are serious, you know, if you're seriously attempting to communicate the idea of whether you're sending it up, or whether you're just making it amazing and, and unreal, you know, by contradiction. Because if, if one thinks of um, similar instances where some marvellous idea has been promoted, like Brunel with his Great Western Railway, the, the thing he had to do was, you know, m make a survey of the thing, a costing of it, and and a reality. He had to promote a a, a reality that, that that was assured to to you know Victorian society to to, to get it back. I, I wonder if you thought there was any. Yeah, I, well, I was fairly conscious of that. One of the things was that the opening of the Artnet exhibition took me rather by surprise and left me with about ten days in which to get the whole thing together. Um, or but, chance of a refusal. Well, <laughs> chance of an embarrassing space with my name on it. <laughs> rather than all the visions that I had with that. And left me with the problem of... I, I see it as very real, but I don't see, I don't see it yet as being very worked out. I mean, I don't see the forms that I'm putting down here as necessarily being the forms that would be adopted by the thing. I don't think that in the conventional, if you like, to pursue the Brun Brunel analogy, Brunel was manipulating real materials, the consequences of the manipulations he could anticipate. Here, what one is doing is proposing that there is a technique of manipulation, which even now has not yet been developed which would have directions, which would be defined functionally, but there would be no role for a designer to predict the three-dimensional form of the function in the conventional sense. And so the only message for myself as the communicator is the idea that, that there is no reality to justify. That would have to be done by a competent botanist, which, I mean, I would fast enjoy becoming, but there's a hell of a lot of reading to do yet. So that, in a way, is why I, I chose to do it in a, well, light-hearted as well, because I think it's an enjoyable thing, and I didn't want to weigh anybody's heart down with it too much. And Brunel, interestingly enough, knew very little about locomotives. He knew about marine engines, but not locomotives. <laughs> now, probably will take a point which is somewhere between Cedric and, and, and James, almost by definition. I think what I find very fascinating, actually, is, you know, the, the uh, I don't know how to call it, perhaps the intellectual or the, the conceptual input. What I'm rather bewildered, and there is some reason why, is, is the output, which means, you know, I see simply great gap of possibilities on one end, on the other end, uh, the great gap of uh, simply unfulfilled uh, <coughs> dreams which might come into between these two opposite sort of extremes. I think you know we can lead a, or follow a very long conversation about all the biological implications, the intricacies of the experimental sort of approach, which is bound to be experimental by and conceptual by its very nature. Now, what I still think that you know one can really take very seriously and with great fascination is the possibility to investigate the edges of the concept because. I've been incidentally involved in a similar process with some people who are just living the conceptual life. Now, what can be really done in translating the edges of the concepts, which oddly enough are not abstract, you know, they're turning to in a cycle into something which is very often almost a mystical intuitive guesses, you know, they're just, uh, uh, you know, just uh, sort of uh, touches into nowhere. Now, in that sphere, you can be incredibly useful, I mean, in, useful in a, in a more, more profound sense to uh, achieve the kind of translation which can be done very often just in images, nothing but. I mean, images, I mean, the imaginary sort of sphere of intellect. You know, we are really, like it or not, really uh, talking in a very sort of uh, rather esoteric sort of intellectual, uh, you know, language by the definition of the sphere you, you choose to, to, to work in. 
Now, what I find very interesting here is, is a tent. You're making interesting, I mean, it's a basic thing. Maybe I'm reading completely wrong, yeah, and you might say that, you know, I didn't understand your message. So what you're really obsessed with is the business of translations. You know, when you really follow the concept, that's the point when you exhaust its intellectual fascination, and you just give it up and translate into your language, which you are at home, and then referring back to uh, the possibility of explicit understanding. I mean, you know, it's a very subtle point, but very crucial one, and probably in the language we have been using here, it came out that we are talking, you know, these two languages at the same time. You know, one of them is implicit and one of them explicit. You're <coughs> talking, you started in a very sort of explicit form, very difficult to understand for laymen, but you know, perfectly clear and absolutely sort of straightforward for a biologist or, 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 or you know, anybody who is operating in, in, in this uh, world. On the other side, you have no words, you have no language when you coming to the product level. Mm. Now, I don't know if I'm making my point clear. What I find absolutely, you know, I don't know, more than fascinating is, is the point where the implicit coming, becoming implicit and vice versa. Yeah. When you really can contribute, because nobody, incidentally, is operating in that level. You know, there are so many skillful draftsmen who can uh, commit themselves to a do a very simple translation of their own thoughts and all you know their all sort of bits and pieces of experience into a commanding image. But you know, they end up in the best with something like a metaphor. I had the impression before you talked that you know this is just that. You know, that thing that is a series of metaphors, mm -hmm. full stop. Mm -hmm. Now I'm very impressed that, in fact, you know, there is far more sort of consistency on the other level, <coughs> which of course opens completely different conversation. And I'm sorry that you have to, you know, let, you yeah, know leave I, now, because I would at least myself be very. Yeah, I, I found that when I was drawing it, I mean, it's really frustrating. You know, I, I, was, I was deadlining like a lunatic to get the thing done at all. And I drew all the drawings and then sat down, having left the, the, the bubbles, to actually write the speech in, mm. which I hoped would carry over a lot of the reality which the drawings made very light of, and found that, in fact, it, it just, I just couldn't hold it together anymore. And, and this, if you read the text, it's, it's dreadful. I mean, if you mm. took all the bubbles out and put them mm. into a situation where you could read them consecutively, I mean, I even... You know, simple things like maintaining a consistent tense throughout, <laughs> just yeah. sort of deteriorating places. Um, that annoyed me, and, and also the fact that it's only by the last drawing that I'm really operating mm. at a drafting level to the point at which the drawings are really saying what I want them to mm. say. I mean, if you compare this drawing and that one with that end, and they were drawn mm. strictly mm. sequentially, I think that the kind of intellectual aspect of it is much clearer in these mm. than it is mm. in those. I mean, these come over much more definitely that, you know, the, the sort of concept of the boat. And it also had to do with the fact that, in a way, the boat is an easier message, and the boat was something that I've been thinking about for a lot longer and was much more familiar with. But there's a strength in those two drawings which is completely lacking in the previous five. Mm. And I think... Mm to draw the whole lot again would come a lot closer to clarifying your criticism of it, which I, I was becoming fast aware of by the end, but too really committed, you know, to, to even see a way of altering it by then. So I will just finish my comments with very one sentence, one sentence only. You know, it might look, and probably looks to many people, like a joke about a particular field of scientific research and possibilities. Mm. You know, it shouldn't be a joke, and I believe that it isn't. Mm. Well, I would hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I just very quickly, uh, as you must be off to fly across the Atlantic five or four minutes from now, says the question of the economy of time. You know, you did this in ten days, and you had sixteen minutes to present this and get some feedback, and so on. And, and I think that the medium you've used is not particularly useful to you because it's a sort of an autoerotic technique. It's uh, starting with a blank sheet and weaving sort of ideas together. And I think you use the word, tenu the, the term tenuosity of argument. And you also talked about a gross biological manipulation. Mm -hmm. The gross manipulation of biology would be a, another way around. It seemed to me that uh, 
you know, perhaps if you have 10 days, three or four days of hard thinking about the problem that you want to solve after you blend all the factors which pr French professors and inc incinerated fertilized e eggs laid by bony chicks and, you know, sort of descended from, I think you used the expression, fartless sprouted, be sprouted beings and so on. So it seemed to me that if you could uh, lay the problem out cold before you start, uh, that'd be a fantastic uh, beginning. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> not half as much fun. And not half as much fun. But I think, I think the process is an interesting one, which is uh, in the old days, in the Beaux-Arts days, was called plan interpretation, which this whole scheme is all about which is taking one theme or two themes or three and then trying to metamorphosize them or whatever Peter calls it and blend them into a single kind of form which has some new character. You've tried two or three sort of biological ideas and it'd be fantastic if, as other people have said, you actually took it down to level of prescription to a problem then got on with the problem itself. I think we're just at the beginning of what you might do, and this might be a, serve as a useful beginning, and you might begin to doodle crossing the Atlantic <laughs> you know, on um, the next portion of the show. Well, I shall uh, have to take my leave. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. What do we do? We, do we hold up cards with numbers? Or? <laughs> the second mark on the right is here. And I think if, if the authors are here, it's, it's interesting to hear what they have to say. Uh, the three that <laughs> Researching that, I came upon uh, Caracalla bats of Rome, which were much more, much more than a bath. They were they served as a civic center, housing forums for poets and libraries and lecture halls and concert areas and, and just about everything. And, and keeping in mind, it was an academic project I picked up uh, 
the little dogma of uh, Corbusier, as far as the, the plan being a generator and the essence of a building being within that plan, I decided to, to create a civic center for the city I was in at the time, um, using the plan of the Cairo Calabas as a generator. So what I did was, I modified the, uh, the outer building, well let me explain this, the outer, the, you've got an outer building and inner building, most of the activities take place here. What I do is I modify the, the outer building to act as a continuous footing for a fry auto design inflatable, low profile inflatable that's internally restrained in three places, also drained in those places. And so that uh, the interior became a climate controlled uh, space and, and the plan of the, the interior building was translated into a topographic map so that the spaces and the functions were not separated by walls anymore, they were separated by changes in elevation and the interior became a Garden of Eden of sorts with, uh, with, the, with the baths as cold, warm and uh, hot water ponds in this, in this landscape environment with all your support facilities underneath. This, this is what I'm working on now, and it's, uh, it's probably me as a, as a Nagel maniac, and, I, and what I'm trying to do is, is influence evolution. And uh, taking into account that, that man supposedly is the only species who is aware of evolution, and therefore in a position to do something about it, I thought it might be a good idea to, uh, to propose a, what I would consider a much better future than the world. We seem to be heading towards, and it's a, uh, it involves a different technology, the development of a biological technology, which will ultimately lead to, for lack of a better word, botanical architecture. And uh, well, I could I could spend about 20 minutes explaining each one of the images, and that might bore everybody solid, but. Uh, If you just do one. Okay. The first one, that's, uh, that's basically the prologue to the whole thing. That's a pseudoscorpion. A pseudoscorpion eats mites. And mites are, uh, are very important in the nitro as nitrogen fixers. And they, uh, they maintain that, that, that nitrogen cycle, which is important for life on the planet. But if the mites get out of hand, they get too numerous eating away at the roots of plants and, and start causing a little bit of destruction. All the pseudoscorpions do is, uh, is flourish at times when, uh, when the mice get out of hand and just keep the population down. And in a sense, they're simply unwittingly serving as guardians of this natural system, this uh, ecological system. And, it, uh, and in a text that will follow these drawings, 